they uh, traditionally uh, do all kinds of names for it, uh, for the Passover and the uh, the Jewish tradition of the Passover lamb being slain this week. And uh, we don't know exact dates on that, but close, close, we know that. And I want you to take your Bibles this morning, turn to Luke 22, and I'm going to do something that I normally do not do but uh, this time of year, but I'd like to today. Um, and we'll look here, a few verses of Scripture here this morning. This week would be the week that the crucifixion took place and the Lord Jesus in the tomb three days and three nights resurrected on Sunday morning, the first day of the week or early, late Saturday night which because they come Sunday morning, he's already gone. But, and so this Good Friday thing is just a myth, really, people. They, they know such thing. Uh, there's no way you can be crucified on Friday and stay in a tomb three days and three nights and resurrect on Sunday. That's just a Catholic tradition. But uh, regardless of the day, we do know it happened. And we do know that he stayed in the tomb, just like Jonah in the belly of the whale, three days, three nights, 72 hours. Whatever. And uh, come up out of the grave. Of course, we'll mention that next week. I'd like to talk this morning about what happened before that. Look in Luke chapter number number um, 22 and look at verse number 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray ye that ye enter not into temptation. And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And he being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. Isn't that something? Uh, and his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. When he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples. And he found them asleep. And you know what? They, they, uh, they, they weren't able to, physically able, wore out. Let's flip over to chapter 23 now. Look in chapter 23. And look at verse number, uh, let's see here. Verse number 33. Chapter 23, verse 33. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, where they crucified, there they crucified him and the male factors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. I want to preach this morning on the subject, five things that were accomplished at Calvary. Five things, there's a, there's a million, but I'm talking about five things that were accomplished at Calvary. In this world, in this world that we're living in, where there's so much stuff happening. And this world that we're living in, where there is so much confusion and so much turmoil and so much hurt and so much pain and so much death and suffering and so much war and famine and bad things going on. It, it's, it's, it helps us this morning to keep our bearings and our minds straight and right on what really matters. And it helps us to keep our eyes on what Jesus did for us on the cross of Calvary near 2,000 years ago. Let's think about that this morning. We understand that. As somebody wrote, in 1980-something, the American Medal Medical Association published an article on the physical death of Jesus Christ on the cross. It uh, talked about the process of his trial leading up to his death and so forth and so on. At that time, crucifixion was considered the worst possible death for the worst of criminals. That's what you did to the absolute worst criminal could be found. That was not all that Jesus faced. He endured whipping so severe that it 
tore his flesh from his body. He was beaten so horrific that his face was torn and his beard jerked out of his face. There were cuts two and three inches in his head all around. They took him out that day and they scourged him. And what they did when they scourged him, they would strip a person of their garments, they'd tie their hands like that right there, and tie them up like to, a, to, a, to the wall or a stake like that and lean them up against that wall. And then one of those soldiers would take, uh, they'd give them what they call scourging, and they'd take like a, a pole with a whip, and they'd take that whip, and it had long straps of leather. You've heard it traditionally called cat of nine tails. The Bible don't say that, but in tradition they say it. And it's got a leather strap, and in those leather straps was little sharp pieces of rock or, or glass, and they had also ball, little round pebble ball that could literally break bones in that when they hit you hard enough. And they'd swept that victim up there, and they'd take it out, and that guy was to give them 39 licks with that thing because then they had an Old Testament law that you couldn't whip a person more than 40. So they stopped at 39. And they took that per thing, and lots of times people would die before they ever got to the cross. They never even made it to the cross because that Roman soldier would take that thing like that, and he'd rear back, and he'd go whack. And when he did, those straps would wrap around that victim's body and he'd jerk it back like that right there and it would cut into their, 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 their a lot of times, literally, their inside bowel would fall out, uh, uh, intestines out on the ground with the blood dripping down. And they beat him like that and the Bible said that they made furrows on his back. You know what I like? You ever plowed a garden? You ever took a tiller and tilled it up a, a, the ground? That's exactly what happened to his back. You see these pictures of Jesus on the cross, and he's, he's like this, you know, and he looks like a girl, and he's got uh, red hair and blue eyes, and, and, he, and, he, uh, and he's got a little blood here and there. That is not the picture that we see in the Bible. In the Bible, the Bible said his visage was marred more than any man. You want a man? There's your man. You young men want a tough guy to look up to? There's your tough guy to look up to, buddy. And I don't mean that disrespectfully. I know about a man that endured the suffering and the shame and the agony. And by the time they got through whipping him, uh, they took him down. The, the Bible said his face, you couldn't even tell what he looked like. His face and body looked like a piece of hamburger meat. I don't ever want to get over what he done for me. Don't ever get over that. I know, it's old, I know some of you have heard that all your life, and it don't even affect you this morning. You're in bad shape. You're in bad shape. Listen, that's what he done to keep me and you from burning in hell. He kept us from burning in hell by suffering the death on the cross there at Calvary. And they ripped that out there and the blood came down. And the Bible said that they took him and then uh, they, they condemned him and, and Pilate said, I find no fault. And, and then about that time, there it was, the cross. It was like two cross ties. Uh, I think it weighs 300 pounds. I don't have a cross tie weighs, but I know they're heavy. And I've, I've tried to lift them for one end of them. Uh, some of them guys, you just grab one up like that. But uh, them things are heavy. I can move them like this and like that. I don't pick them up and carry them around. And that was cross. They have a cross like that right there. They put the victim, the Lord Jesus, down. And, and the Bible said that they crucified him. They would take nails about that long. Nine inch nails, a rock group, because they can't stand him, they're jealous of him, made a rock group and called it Nine Inch Nails. All those rock singers are jealous of the power of Jesus Christ. That's why Ozzy and Madonna and all them, why are them upside down? They're pitiful little excuses for a human being that's jealous of the real man, the Lord Jesus Christ. You want a real man? There's your real man. There's your real man. Uh, a real man is not a little effeminate sissy walking around uh, trying to make money off people on um, Taylor Swift or something. A real man is a man that's got enough uh, integrity and morality and righteousness to let them beat him 
for those that he loves and cares about. This Our generation crazy, people. I'm talking to you, a real man. Then they took that man out there and they put him on the cross. They laid the victim down on the cross and there he was. The Bible said through his hands and his feet. Our modern day scholars like to make a big deal trying to find fault with the Bible saying, well, it, it, it couldn't have been in his hands because it would have ripped through right there. So it had to be in here, his wrist. And they think that makes them real smart. The Bible said his hands. What they don't know, since they don't read the Bible, is that in the Bible, your whole wrist from here down is the hand. The Bible said back there in Genesis, uh, when they put that, put that bracelet on that girl's hand, a bracelet goes right here. So that right there is considered hand in the Bible. But you're running all kind of dumb stuff like that if you don't read the Bible. You don't, you don't, you're not educated. And uh, that's right. You're, you're pitiful. Uh, if you don't know anything what the Bible is. So from here down would be the hand. Cause, so they took that nail and they put him down. They put that hand, nail down like that right there. And a big old soldier held that nail. And another one came with a hammer like a sledgehammer. And Jesus put his hand out there. Y'all want a love story? There's you some love. Oh, I just want, I just want real love. That's real love. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his reason. That's for me and you, y'all. And they took that hammer and went, bam, through one hand. Bam, beat it all the way in to that cross. And then the other hand, willingly laid it down. Oh, you're just trying to make it. Listen, I wish I could say it so real that you could see it in your mind. What he did for us on the cross. The Bible said he put that through his hands and through his feet. And the blessed Lamb of God, the spotless, pure Son of the living God, put his hand out there just for me. You know why I preach? That right there is why I'm a preacher. You know why we try to go and try to help people and get them live right and serve God? Because if he loved us that much, the least we can do is live for him. By the way, if that right there won't make you live right, nothing will. Nothing will. I can fuss and scream and holler and make you feel guilty and everything else. You won't never live right until the love of God gets a hold of your heart just right and makes you love Him. He did. He gave it all. They, 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 the, the Bible tells us uh, uh, it was suffering. A crown of thorns, three inches thorns, was placed on his head and then a uh, hammer and beat in, into his head. And you know, your forehead bleeds freely. So blood come all the way down his face, all the way over his lips, all the way over his mouth, uh, down from his nose, and drip down there. It was excruciating pain, creating a slow and agonizing death. The Roman soldiers knew that, that, those, uh, that, that the tendons would break. And uh, uh, so they put it right in here, forcing Jesus to support himself with his, with his legs. And they say when a person was on a cross like that, it would hurt so bad that they'd push up to try to take the pressure off their hands. And then it would hurt so bad they'd let go to try to take the pressure. And it hurt their feet so bad they'd push up and just up and down. And a lot of times they couldn't breathe right here and literally suffocated on the cross and lost his, lost his breath and died. I'm telling you, that's just, uh, that's not even, uh, that, that movie they made, uh, that, that showed some pretty graphic stuff. And that lot of, but I'm telling you, uh, in, in real life, uh, there wasn't people sitting there watching it with popcorn and music playing and, and a pretty uh, surrounding. It was awful. It was awful. They laughed. They mocked at him like they're still doing today. They laughed at the Lord Jesus Christ. They, oh, you Christians are crazy. You're crazy enough to believe the Bible. All that. But I'm telling you, he stood there and hung there in agony. Now listen, y'all. You know who he done that for? You. He done that for every cuss word you've ever said, every lie you've ever told, every time you've laid down with somebody you ain't married to, every time you've drank alcohol, every time you've ever stole anything. That's why he did it to pay the price for mine and your sin. Thank God for Calvary. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to, uh, to bear mine and your guilt. That's what happened. That's just a little bit. 
at Calvary. He carried the weight of the sins of the world. And God's wrath was satisfied. That's what it took. That's so that we can believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Now let me say, I'll just read these off to you. Five things that he accomplished at Calvary. Number one, the, the first thing, the law was magnified. The law was magnified. What does that mean? That means nobody ever kept the law literally. Not one person in the Old Testament ever kept the Old Testament, Mosaic, Ten Commandments, and then the rest of the moral law. Not one. Not one. Not Moses, and he wrote them. Not, not, uh, not Joshua and all them guys, and they care. Not the high priest, not the, not the low priest, uh, not, the, not the, the, the congregants, not the people in the wilderness, not the people going to the tabernacle. Not one person in the Old Testament ever kept the law completely. Buddy, that law was strict. And I mean, they, I mean, they had all kinds of things they had to do. Not just Ten Commandments. All the other, the laws and the sacrifices and the, I mean, they could, you couldn't even think wrong, brother. I, I mean, the Sabbath day, all of that stuff. And Jesus came and at Calvary, the law was magnified. Now think about this for a second. I've heard, I've heard a lot of people say erroneously, a lot of people say, oh, well, that, that law, that's the Old Testament. Jesus come and done away with the law, and now we're in the New Testament. And, uh, and they, they, they give you this impression that, uh, that the law just was nullified and done away with, and, and, and you won't fool with it no more, and don't worry about it, all that kind of stuff. No, no, you got that completely wrong. Jesus, listen to me, Jesus did not come to nullify the law. He come to fulfill the law. Nobody had ever lived it, and he come to fulfill it. You see? As a matter of fact, he magnified it. You know, you know what that means? They come to him one time and they said, uh, so, uh, you ain't supposed to kill nobody, right? That's murder. He said, that's right. They said, oh, hey, ain't never done that. And you know, you know what he said? He said, if you hate your brother in your heart, you're a murderer. So if you got hate in your heart, it makes you a murderer. He took that commandment and magnified it and said, whoa, 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 whoa. You, you, don't, you don't have to go out here and just shoot somebody and cut their head off. You can hate somebody and have murder in your heart. Have you ever hated somebody? Sure you have. I have too. Hey, hey ain't none of us ever. He, he lived 33 and one half years and never broke. One law. Said one time, they said, uh, oh, so you're not supposed to commit adultery, right? And he said, that's right. Well, they ain't never done that. And you know what he said? He said, but if you look at a person with lust, you've committed adultery in your heart. <whistles> uh, you know, oh, no. You, you might not have never done it. But that, in your, that old adultery is in your heart. That murder is in your heart. And that, that, that we're, we're sunk, buddy. We're sunk. We're done for. There ain't no hope for us. So Jesus came and fulfilled all of that law and magnified all of that law and he, he, he fulfilled it to the very T. He didn't come to do away with it. He come to fulfill it. He come to fulfill it. Number two, you know what happened at Calvary? Justice was satisfied. Justice was satisfied. By law, we could not get into heaven. We could not get into heaven. We broke law. We sinned against God. But at Calvary, justice was satisfied. You see, a lot of people don't understand about God. God is up there in heaven on his throne, and God looks down, and he's nothing but holy. He's absolutely pure. He don't see nothing wrong. He don't think nothing wrong. Everything's holy, completely holy with God. Well, here we are down here, and look at us. What a mess. Uh, look at me. Oh, 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 Danny. And, and I looked down and said, I want to go to heaven. And the Lord said, I can't let you in here, bud. And I said, why? I'm pretty, I'm better than so-and-so. He said, you and so-and-so, neither one ain't getting in here. He said, you ain't, none of you's getting in here. You, you can't, you're not justified. You're not justified. Well, I'm doing the best I can. Good night. Let me in. Nope, nope. You, you can't, you, I'm not letting no sin in this place. I said, I'm in a mess. And I, he said, yes, you are. Then the Bible said, for God so loved the world 
that he gave his only begotten son. See? So it's like this. It's like this. I looked up there. If I'd had to stand before God, I'd say, uh, here I am, Lord. Danny, I want him to heaven. Well, let's see your record, Danny. And there you are in a third grade on a school bus. And first time you ever really told a lie. Oh, you started cussing right then. And then you did, 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 did and the list gets on longer, 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 longer. And some of y'all, Lord, your list would reach from here to Charlotte and back. And mine probably would do. And you think God's going to let you in heaven? You think you're going to let you in heaven? He ain't forgot, he ain't forgetting all that stuff. I mean, every bad thing you've ever done, whatever you did last night, it's wrote on your record. And it's going to come out on you at the court, on, in your court date. Coming out, right there now. I think, you know what? You know what? We're in a mess. We're condemned. The whole world, he that believeth not, is condemned already. We're done for, brother. But, but the good news, but the good news. Oh, hallelujah, I'm going to shout just thinking about it. There came a man one day, and he said, Behold, in the volume of the book, it is written to me to do thy will, O God. And his name was Jesus. And he and I say, uh, let's see his record. And look up there. Uh, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. He never messed up one time, Lord. He's perfect. He's absolutely perfect. And uh, the Lord said, who's that? Jesus Christ, your son. He's over here. His record, perfect. Look through there, not a thing. All blank pages. Not one sin. Not one thought he shouldn't have thought. Not one step he shouldn't have taken. Not one word he shouldn't have spoke. Not one place he ever went. You listen to me? Not one mistake ever, 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 ever. A perfect sinless life. And the Lord said, uh, I love Danny and I did this for him. So the Lord, when I get saved, he takes my record and throws it away and puts his record on me. You understand that? You understand that? And I say, here's my record. And my record's clear today. For he washed my sins away. Yes, the old account was settled. Long ago, glory to God. Woo! Thank God. I'm glad I know where. Listen, Duke, Caroline, come on. Man. Give me a break, people. We ought to be the shouting as bunch of people in the whole world. We ain't going to hell, man. Let no stupid ball game we're in. We are, we're, we're winners. We're winners. Our debt's been paid. The sacrifice has been made. The doors are open. My record clear today. Oh, he washed my sins away. Justice was satisfied. You know what justified means? Just, justified don't mean, well, you're guilty, but I'm going to let you in. Like OJ. <laughs> you know, like, or somebody, you know, the way they say you're not guilty. When the court says not guilty, that don't mean you're innocent. That just means they're not convicting you of that crime. You got off the hook. That means that's what not guilty. The Lord don't look at us as not guilty. He looks at us as innocent. Justified. Just if I'd never sinned. Justified. Never done it. Justified. Never. That's, that sounds. Listen. If that don't put a shout in your soul. Something wrong with you. Glory to God in heaven, people. That's the best news the world's ever heard. I can, I can go to the, the, the guy that I, I went to yesterday, or day before, last Saturday, and on bus route, and we found people living under bridges, man. I talked to them living under bridges, and I, I got down to these bunch of guys, and it's down underneath this bridge down there on 85, and there's living out there, and there's all, uh, and, I, and, I, and I parked out there at the IHOP down there in Gastonia. And uh, I looked down there, and there's just a bunch of guys, a uh, girl too, I think, and there's, there's all standing around down there living, living out there. And they had their clothes out here hanging on a, hanging on a, uh, a tree limb. And, you know, they had some kind of little tent, and it's hard. My heart, my heart just broke. And I jumped down off this, this uh, cement wall there a little bit, and I, I grabbed me some tracks, and I went out there, and they looked, and they looked at me like, you're a cop. I said, no, I ain't no cop. I'm a preacher. And they looked at me and said, you're a preacher? I said, that's right. And they said, what kind of preacher are you? I said, Baptist. They said, oh, okay, that's what we are. <laughs> I said, that's what I figured you was. <laughs> and 
like, like Jack Howe said, he went and preached in a, in a prison, uh, uh, jail one day up there in Hammond. They had so many people been saved up there. They, they, and I said, how y'all doing in here? I'm going to introduce myself. They said, that's all right, Reverend. We all members of your church. <laughs> but but uh, I, went, I went down and I said, hey, y'all, I got some good news for you. And I mean, there's trucks going by there and, and people never even, and I said, the Lord loves you. And they said, you know what? Pre preach to it. You're a preacher, preach. And so I did. And I told them that there's the greatest story ever told. I'll tell you something, people. There's a great man named G. Campbell Morgan. Keep that story in mind about me down there with them homeless people. There ain't, there ain't no difference in me. I got a suit and tie. There ain't no difference in me and them. Except what Jesus Christ done for me. G. Campbell Morgan preached a great revival. And he said, way up there in, uh, I forgot where we're going, big crusade somewhere. And he preached revival. And he said that morning, they had a whole bunch of people at church from all over town. And he said there was, he, he gave the invitation. And there was a man come to the altar over here on this side. They didn't know it. That man had just got out of prison. He'd been sent off for something, had a bad record. And somebody prayed with him. He's asked the Lord to forgive him, come into his heart, and the man got saved. Over here on the other side of the altar, uh, not looking, looked like a businessman also came to the altar that morning. And he got down. There's over here praying, praying, praying. It just so happened that guy had just got out of jail and got down and got saved. This man was, uh, had been the mayor and a judge in that little town. They said he was known all over town for having absolute highest impeccable, I mean wonderfully high moral standards. Everybody in the town knew that that man was a very, very, very straight, uh, clean, living, moral man. He got down over here and they prayed with him, told him the same story, and he got saved. And we all stood up and started shaking hands. They found out this guy, this, this uh, judge here, had been the one who had sentenced that fella to prison. And they, they didn't know that at first. This guy just got out of jail. He got saved. And the judge over here, he got saved. And the preacher got and said, look, it took the same blood. It took the same sacrifice. It took, it wasn't like the Lord said, oh, there's an old mean guy over there. Boy, that's right. Oh, he was a good guy. He, no, the Lord looked at them both the same. The Lord looked at that guy who had just got out of prison and the moral judge the same. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all on the same level. Let me tell you something, people. There ain't nobody in the world no better than nobody else. Don't you ever look down your nose like, oh, I'm, no, you ain't. You're probably worse. All right, listen, brother, we're all in the same boat. We're all sinners. We've all offended the holy God. We've all broke his laws. We've all broke his commandments. But thank God, thank God, he made a way that me and you could trust in him and have everlasting life and leave this world and know where we're going when we leave here. That was accomplished at Calvary. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. The great skeptic laughed at the Bible, decided to laugh about it. And one day, him and his wife talking, they said, You know what? Let's just see if this is real. I want to, let's read it one hour a day for a while. His wife said, After that, they did a while, she said, You know what? If this book's right, we're all wrong. They read another week, and his wife said, if this book's right, we're all lost. And they read it for a few more weeks, and finally the man said, wife, if this book's right, we can all get saved. That's what you're into this morning. If that book's right, you're in trouble. But if it's right, there's a way out of your trouble. And you know, when I, when I say if, you know, I, I'm just making an illustration. It's right. If that ain't truth, there ain't no truth. If that ain't right, there's anybody's guess as good as anybody else was right. 
Every man does what is right in his own eyes. But Jesus accomplished that at Calvary. And John Newton, the great songwriter, everybody knows, you should know if you went to the right kind of school, you'd know who John Newton is. If you went to public school, they don't, they don't, they don't know the questions, let alone the answers. And they, John Newton was on that old slave trade boat. Wicked, wicked, evil man got saved. One day he sat down and wrote a song. He said, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. And John Newton's one that made that little saying that every preacher in the world says, I'm not everything I should be. I'm not everything I want to be. I'm not everything people think I ought to be. I'm not. I'm not everything I want to be. I tell you, thank God I ain't what I used to be. The Lord done something for me, y'all. I've made a mess out of it. But I'll tell you one thing. God done something for me. He done something for me when I was 18 that I ain't never been able to get over since. And all that was accomplished at Calvary. Can I ask you a question this morning? Wouldn't you like for his record to be on your account? I mean, is there anybody here this morning who wants to stand in front of God, let your whole life right in front of God and everybody? Lord, no. When I get up there, I'm going to pull out Jesus' records right here. Danny Castle, right here. And when he looks, he cannot find a thing. What's the song say? My name is written there. That's some things. I never get to all five of them that were accomplished at Calvary. Let's stand with our heads bowed. The girls got to come get a song right now. Every head bowed and every eyes closed this morning. Every head bowed. Every eyes closed. Nobody's moving. Nobody's talking. Every head bowed and every eyes closed. It's not an accident that you're here this morning. God brought you here. You're here this morning, friend. He loves you. He loves you and Jesus Christ died for your sins according to the scripture. Right now, I want you to let God speak to your heart. If you had to die on the way home this evening, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying you will, I, but nobody knows. Nobody knows. You let God speak to your heart today. While they sing, get out of your seat. Come down here to this altar. Just get down and say, Lord, I want to be saved. I want to get saved. Getting saved, best thing that ever happened to me, y'all. It's the best thing that ever happened to you. Is there anybody in here this morning? You say, preacher, I've been saved, but man, I've messed up. I really, really need your prayers this morning. I need God to do something in my life. Preacher, would y'all pray for me this morning? Would you let us just slip up your hand and let us pray for you this morning? Anybody? Slip up your hand. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Hands all over the building. God bless you. God bless you. Amen. All right. If you're here this morning, you need to move. You need to move. Well, they're going to sing that. We're going to pray. They're going to sing that first verse. You let God speak to your heart. Get down here on your knees. Get it right. Somebody pray with you. Somebody will help you. You can get saved this morning. You can get saved this morning. Why don't you come, young lady, young man, mom or dad? You come. Father, do what ought to be done right now. Take these few words and may the Holy Ghost of God use them for your glory. Have you in our hearts? Dear God, thank you for the greatest story ever told. Lord, thank you that no greater love had no man than this. That a man laid down his life for his friend. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for me. Thank you, Lord, that you died to keep me from hell fire. Lord God, please help us today. Help that one that needs to step out. Make that step this morning. Not wait another minute The time run out. In Jesus' name I ask it. And for his sake we pray. Amen. They're singing. Some are coming already. You come on. You just come. You lifted your hand. You need to come. Come on. Come on. Come on right now. Come on right now. Come on. Amen. Yeah. That's right. Come on. Amen. Amen. Will you pray for this young man here? Amen. Let's, let God speak your heart this morning. Come on. Let the Lord speak your heart, young lady. Young man, you need to come. You come right now. Come on. Amen. Ladies, pray for these kids here, y'all. 
Amen. That's a gang up right there. Back to Calvary. That's right. Yeah. Take me back to Calvary. Remind me where I was. Remind me where I was. Remind me what it was. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Redeemed is how I plead. Forgiven's where I stand. And when the voice of doubt and unbelief has driven me to my knees, and I wonder how to love a wretch like me, take me back to Calvary. Amen. You need to come now. Amen. You need to get back to Calvary. You need to get back to Calvary. Come on. Amen. Sometimes the way Amen. is crushed. Amen. You need to get back to Calvary this morning. You need to get back where you ought to be. You need to get your heart right. Now's the time to do, do it. Now's the place. The Lord loves you. And he paid the price for your sin on the cross. You need to come. Come on. That's right, girl. Come on. That's right, teenagers. Mama, daddy. Let's get in here. We've been to some God here this morning. You alone are my rock and my deep. Take me back to Calvary. Take me to the cross. Remind me where I was. Remind me what it cost. You thought I was worth it. Let's get back to Calvary. Redeemed is now I plead. Come on, girl. Come on, come on, come on, right now, come on, young lady, come on, young man, let's go, obey God, amen, amen, that's right, that's right, Lord, take me back to Calvary, take me back over there to Calvary, take me back to Calvary, amen, amen, take me back to Calvary, 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 Take me back to Calvary. Take me to the cross. Remind me where I was. Remind me what it cost. You thought I was worth it. Even knowing who I am. Redeemed is how I plead. Forgiven's where I stand. of doubt and unbelief has driven me to my knees and I wonder how you still love a wretch like me take me back to Calvary Calvary. playing softly this morning something still praying something still praying (laughs) can't you feel can't you feel what a breath of fresh air this is after being out there in that crazy mess all week. World gone crazy, people. I mean, literally nuts. You get in here, you get in here in church, the Spirit of God start moving like it is in here, and you think, okay, okay, okay. That's what's important. That's what we should live for. That's how we should live our life. The Bible says it like this. We know that we are of God, the whole world, life, and wickedness. So what's wrong with the world? He's laying in the devil's lap. He's having his day right now. He's having his day. And I'm glad we can come out. Come out. That's what the church, ecclesia. That's what the word church is. That's the Greek word, ecclesia. Called out and come together and know what our purpose here on this earth is. Our purpose on this earth is not to make the world a better place to live in. You forget that. Our purpose on earth is to rescue the perishing, care for the dying, uh, and, and, and care about people that need help and rescue those that are perishing. That's what our mission is. Hallelujah. Mm. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Whew. Boy, it's starting to feel good in here right now. I'm telling you, there's somebody in here between, besides us, y'all. Somebody's in this place besides me and you. It ain't some spooky something we made up. The presence of God is in this place. 
When people pray and fast, that's, that's what brings the presence of God. You ever heard people say, speak of the devil and he'll show up? That's true. You fool around with Ouija boards and stuff like that, the devil will get on you. And you start getting here worshiping the Lord and call him out and he'll show up. Thank the Lord. Now what we're going to do, is going to unhitch here for a little while and come back at 6 o'clock this evening. Um, I've got a, a very special message. I'm planning on next Sunday morning. I don't believe I ever announced what I was going to preach on Easter Sunday, but I might. Lord, don't change my mind. Uh, a message that I've been thinking about. It's an old gospel song we play on the radio. And the title of it is, He didn't stay dead and he won't stay gone. Yeah. Amen? He didn't stay dead and he ain't staying gone neither. Well, it's sort of an old country gospel song. I heard on the radio, man, that'd be a good title for a sermon. He didn't stay dead. Thank God he ain't going to stay gone neither. That ain't the end of the story, by no means. So you don't want to miss next Sunday morning. Bring your whole family. Put the lampshades on them. What have you got to do? Uh, uh, they're going to have a special day on, 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 the, on, the, uh, on the buses. And uh, we're excited about that. We'll talk about that tonight also. Okay? All right. We ain't done yet, y'all. So everybody, don't miss, don't miss tonight. Come pray them. Bring your Bible. And you'll need to be here. Okay? All right, we'll bow our head and we'll be dismissed in prayer. Everybody bow your head. We'll be dismissed in word of prayer. Fellowship a little bit before you go uh, this morning and be friendly in the Lord and be back this seat. We've got a busy evening, uh, so let's, uh, let's do it. Brother Eric, dismiss with you, brother.